Harry Peake Pierpont, was born on October 13, 1902. He was a Prohibition-era gangster, convicted murderer and bank robber. He was a friend and mentor to John Dillinger. John Herbert Dillinger was an American gangster of the Great Depression. He led a group known as the Dillinger Gang, which was accused of robbing 24 banks and four police stations. Dillinger was imprisoned several times but escaped twice. He was charged, but not convicted of the murder of an East Chicago, Indiana, police officer who shot Dillinger in his bulletproof vest during a shootout. It was the only time Dillinger was charged with homicide. Pierpont was born in Munsey, Indiana, to Joseph Gilbert and Lena Orchid Pierpont. By the 1910 census, the family was residing at 1145 McLean Street in Indianapolis, Indiana, where Harry's father's occupation was listed as a woodworker at a carriage factory. In the 1911 and 1912 directories of the city of Indianapolis, the family was living at 1234 Lee Avenue. Pierpont graduated from the 8th grade at Assumption School in Indianapolis. He had above average intelligence and did well in school. By the 1920 census, the family was residing at 2113 Morris Street in Indianapolis, Indiana, where Harry's occupation was listed as a bench worker at an automobile plant. Pierpont's troubles with the police began after an accident in the summer of 1921, in which he received a severe head injury. His demeanor was changed after the accident and Pierpont complained of eye problems, dizziness and headaches. Pierpont displayed bouts of sleeplessness and mania for firearms. He stood over six feet tall, with light brown hair and blue eyes. The second and third toes of his feet were grown together. At his May 1925 trial in Kokomo, his place of residence was never clearly established. He was said to have lived in Fort Wayne, Toledo and Indianapolis, and was known to have hung around Kokomo for some time before the bank robbery was framed. On January 2, 1922, Pierpont stole an automobile in Indianapolis and drove to Green Castle, where he robbed the Cook Hardware Store stealing nine handguns. Five days later, Pierpont was arrested in Indianapolis for attempted auto theft and battery with intent to kill. The owners of the automobile, Mr. and Mrs. Devine, caught him in the act. Struggling with Mr. Devine, Pierpont fired a gun, slightly wounding him. Mrs. Devine was holding a roast and hit Pierpont over the head with it. While being held in jail at Tarot, Pierpont failed in an escape attempt, sawing through the bars of his cell. By November 1924, Pierpont was living in Kokomo, Indiana staying at a boarding house run by Pearl Elliott. He continued to associate with a group of Jeffersonville ex-cons in April, 1925 Pierpont was implicated as ringleader of a gang that struck several Indiana banks. Newspaper reports indicated there were seven members of the gang, and all identified Pierpont as their leader. Most members of the gang were arrested, and convicted before Pierpont was arrested in Detroit in the spring. Mrs. Everett Bridgewater was arrested at her home in Indianapolis and sentenced to 2 to 14 years. James Robbins, arrested at Lebanon, Indiana. Marion Red Smith arrested at Indianapolis. George Fraser arrested at Marion. 
and Robert Morse arrested at Indianapolis were all given sentences of between 10 and 20 years. And Mrs. Emily Morse pleaded guilty and was given a sentence from 2 to 14 years. The roundup of these bandits was reported as one of the biggest roundups of any gang of robbers in the state. At 2.45 in the afternoon of November 26, 1924, seven men led by Pierpont held up the South Marion State Bank at 31st and Washington Streets in Marion, Indiana. Robbing the bank of approximately $4,000 in cash. No one was injured, and not a shot was fired. Five men went inside, to stay outside. Shortly before 4 o'clock on March 10, 1925, four unmasked bandits walked into the New Harmony Bank and Trust in New Harmony, and robbed it of $10,000. The bandits locked the employees and customers into the safe and took $6,000 in cash and $4,000 in bonds from the vault. When the bank treasurer, Frank Steelman, failed to open the safe, he was hit with the butt of a pistol and suffered a severe scalp injury. The assistant cashier, Mrs. Schultz, opened the safe and then fainted. The bandits escaped in a gray Hudson sedan in the direction of Evansville, being last seen near Wadesville. A farmer near Griffin, Indiana reported that the men held him up and was commanded to tell them where they could obtain a boat to cross the Wabash River. By March 11th, reports had the gang spotted at King, Indiana in Gibson County. Peace officers throughout the Midwest were wired descriptions of the men and advised to take no chances. Guards were placed along every road in southern Indiana with orders to shoot to kill. Fort Wayne police were also investigating the gang's involvement in the robbery of an A and P store on March 21, 1925. On March 22, 1925, Earl Northern, along with Everett Bridgewater, was arrested by Kokomo, Indiana police on suspicion of possessing a stolen car. The certificate of title was in the name of Lester Isaacs of Indianapolis. However, the possession of the Ford Roadster they were driving was found to be legitimate and they were released. This car was later identified as one that was used in the getaway from the South Kokomo Bank robbery. Pierpont later visited local attorney C.T. Brown, along with Dewey Elliott and Pearl Mulendor after midnight on March 22, 1925 to explain that two of his friends had been detained at the police station and needed representation. Pierpont using the alias Mason, refused to give the names of his friends who were detained, but gave him a gold certificate worth $100. In the morning, the attorney learned that the suspects had been picked up for auto theft, but had later been released. Pierpont, along with Thaddeus Ted, Skier and Skier's girlfriend, Louise Brunner, were arrested by the Detroit police at their apartment on April 2, 1925. Pierpont was alleged to be the leader in the robbing of the South Marion, Upland and South Kokomo Bank. At his arrest, Pierpont gave his name as Frank Mason, but later in the day admitted his identity. Revolvers and guns were found under the pillows in the closets and drawers of the bureaus. Harry was found to have $850 in new $100 and $50 bills on his person, and Brunner had a number of diamond rings and other jewelry. Police were tipped off to Skier's involvement when it was learned that the auto used in the Kokomo robbery had been stolen from Fort Wayne a few days before. Skier had been suspected in the automobile theft, 
And when the robbery was reported, police began working on the theory that Skier was involved. The three prisoners waived extradition and warrants charging petty larceny and bank robbery charging Pierpont and Skier had been issued by Kokomo City Judge Joseph Kripe. Reports indicated Howard County Prosecutor Howard Miller would pursue habitual criminal charges against both men, which would carry life sentences. Skier had been sentenced from Allen County. Indiana in 1917 to the state penal farm on a charge of larceny. The Indiana Bankers Association had been looking for Pierpont since the robbery of the Grand County Banks and had been on his trail for some time. Captain William Pappert of the Fort Wayne Police Department had reported that Skier had been seen at the Brunner woman's home with a large sum of money. When it was learned that Brunner intended to travel to Detroit to meet Skier, detectives followed her to the apartment shared by Skier and Pierpont, where the arrests occurred. Skier and Brunner were arrested when they met in the city, and Pierpont's arrest occurred a short time later. Initial reports in the Marion newspaper could not verify that suspect Everett Bridgewater had also been arrested. Bridgewater's wife, Mary, had previously been arrested in connection with the gang's activities and was serving a term at the Indianapolis Women's Prison. On April 3rd, James Roscoe Whitey Hayes, a third suspect, was also arrested by the Detroit police, but later released. Conflicting reports indicated that Hayes was wanted in Detroit as a material witness in a murder case. In Detroit, Pierpont, Skier and Hayes were all positively identified by A. E. Gordon, cashier of the South Kokomo Bank, Sheik Nelson, golf professional at the Country Club, and Vernon Shaw. It was Nelson who identified Hayes, a locally known singer, which allowed detectives to put the pieces together in tracking the members of the gang. Hayes had been identified by Cashier Gordon as the bandit who stood in the doorway of the South Kokomo Bank as it was robbed. It was determined by the Kokomo police that members of the gang had been in the city for several weeks prior to the robbery of the South Kokomo Bank. Pierpont Skier and Hayes were known to have rooms with Mrs. Pearl Mullendor at 718 North Main Street. Mullendor was more frequently known as Pearl Elliott, a notorious Kokomo madam, who would figure prominently in Harry's later career with Dillinger. Members of the gang reportedly threw wild parties in Kokomo and Anderson, Indiana where they displayed large sums of money to their women and spent like drunken sailors. Pierpont and Skier were extradited to Kokomo for trial and held in the Howard County Jail. They were brought back to Kokomo under heavy guard, coming from Detroit to Peru by train and then on to Kokomo by auto. Pierpont was found guilty. He was sent back to Pendleton and entered the Indiana Reformatory for the second time on May 6, 1925. He defied authorities by giving the wrong name, refusing to recognize the warden, declining to make a statement or having his picture taken, and spitting on a guard. Entering Michigan City on July 30, 1925. He became one of the most respected convicts in the prison. He soon became the leader of an elite group of former bank robbers. Forever trying to escape, Pierpont constantly fought with the guards and was frequently confined to solitary confinement. He was known for his ability to withstand hunger and beatings. Pierpont headed a prison clique that included Russell Clark, Charles Makeley, John Red, Hamilton and Dillinger, after his July 1929 transfer.
Barry's ability to endure hunger and beatings won him the respect of all the prisoners. On December 29, 1930, Pierpont was among a group of 12 men, led by Joseph Burns, who overpowered guard Guy Burklau and barricaded the doors of their cell block to prevent guards from entering. Pierpont let himself out of his cell with a homemade key. Burklau was able to sound the alarm, and a combined group of city police, firemen and guards were able to force the inmates to surrender. Burns had fashioned a key from a spoon, allowing the inmates to escape their cells. All the men were in cell house D, and the break occurred at a time when the guard force was limited. Others involved in the scheme besides, Burns and Pierpont were Albert Ross Heberg, James Jenkins, Dick Day, Howard Ware, Maurice Glacier, Frank Badgley, Lewis West, Wayne Williams, Willard Tex, Russell Clark, all of whom were serving long sentences for murder, bank robbery and other habitual offenses. On September 25, 1933, Pierpont, Russell Clark, Makeley, and Hamilton conferred during the exercise period and decided to crash out on the next day. Each man swore an oath not to be recaptured without a fight. The next morning, Pierpont, Makeley, Hamilton, Russell Clark, Walter Diedrich, James Oklahoma Jack Clark, Edwards House, Joseph Fox, Joe Burns, and Jim Jenkins escaped from Michigan City. Using 345 caliber pistols Dillinger had smuggled into the jail, the escape had been carefully planned before Dillinger's parole by Pierpont, Hamilton and Dillinger. Dillinger had spent the summer of 1933 robbing banks throughout Indiana and Ohio to raise enough money to smuggle the guns into the prison. How he smuggled the guns in is unknown, some accounts say that Dillinger tossed the weapons over the wall like he did on his previous attempt. The most widely believed theory is that Dillinger hid the guns in boxes of thread sent to the prison shirt factory. Heading out west to lie low, Pierpont, Dillinger, Makeley, and Clark ended up in Tucson, Arizona. Flush with cash and careless, the gang made several minor mistakes which led to their being recognized and captured, one by one on January 25, 1934. All four men and their girlfriends were extradited back to the Midwest. Dillinger to Indiana for O'Malley's murder, the other three to Ohio for Sheriff Sarber's murder. In early March 1934, Pierpont, Makeley and Clark were convicted of the murder. While Clark got a life sentence, Pierpont and Makeley were sentenced to die in the electric chair. Pierpont was executed at the Ohio Penitentiary on October 17, 1934. Still suffering from injuries incurred during his attempted escape, he had to be carried to the electric chair where he was successfully put to death, and pronounced dead at 12.14 a.m. Pierpont was 32 years, at the time of his execution. Thank you for watching Death Row.